Welcome to Inside Chips, the podcast that keeps you up to speed on the fast-moving world of the semiconductor industry. I'm your host, Gregory Haley. Last week's design automation conference marked a pivotal moment for electronic design automation. Artificial intelligence workloads are now steering everything from transistor choices to package architecture. To unpack what happened at this year's conference, I spoke with our editor-in-chief, Ed Sperling, who outlined the forces reshaping design, including 3D IC, photonics, reliability, and an emerging chiplet economy. Welcome, Ed. What's the big news from DAC this year? I think the entire show was buzzing with AI and what to do about AI. AI has driven the need for 3D ICs, has driven the need for a uh, whole bunch of new technologies, materials, you name it. But from a design side, it's become how do we deliver enough performance and enough power savings in order to make this all work? And you went around the, the entire show and nearly every booth had an AI something in it. Within the within the DAC group, has there been discussion about a move toward disaggregation within the individual dies in order to accomplish some of these AI needs? Well, that's been going on for a while with two and a half D, but what we're starting to hear now is full three D ICs, which is a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. You basically shorten the channels, you thinned out some of the dies, the metal layer. There's more metal layers stacked in. There's uh, backside power delivery going into these. There's potentially photonics coming in. It's about moving massive amounts of data very quickly and also uh, being able to process that, that data and store it in many places. Now, the big problem, of course, with 2.5D and some of the continued scaling is that you need so much SRAM, and SRAM does not shrink at the same rate as everything else. So just being able to tighten that up and tighten up those interconnects and shorten them and make them wider and faster things like hybrid bonding are going to be absolutely essential here there's a whole bunch of issues that need to be solved and a lot of that is being driven by eda because you basically collapse the front front end of the design to the back end on the manufacturing it all has to be done concurrently at least to some extent We've been hearing about this memory wall. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, the memory wall is basically the, the problem is that you need massive amounts of memory in order to be able to store all this data. And the problem is that SRAM does not shrink. This has been the go-to memory type for, for years in SOCs. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that now you've got all this digital logic shrinking down so it'll fit into an SOC, but it's getting very, very expensive and shrinking, trying to shrink the SRAM is almost impossible. So breaking it apart, putting it into a multi-die assembly, adding in some sort of advanced packaging and being able to put the memory where it makes sense, possibly closer to the, uh, the logic where this, all this data is being processed. You can run vertical through silicon vias from the logic to the memory and you can also use those vias for potentially moving some of the heat out it's basically little chimneys so this is all possible in 3d ic it is not possible in two and a half d two and a half d is basically a shrunken pcb you don't have that kind of tight interconnect you have more space in between them you're running off of an interposer and that interposer has some benefits in terms of dissipating heat but it's thicker than what you need for a 3D IC. So the shorter the distance, the faster the signals travel, the more you can process faster. What else can be done to move the data faster? What we're starting to see is the recognition that you need to be able to move some of this data with light. Now light, of course, it moves at an incredible speed. You can move it with very little heat. And this is really where a lot of the focus has come in. You certainly can move data between racks of servers, you can move it across a data center. But what we're starting to see is the ability to move that data between packages. It has not come to within the chip yet. I'm not even sure we'll ever get there. But in terms of the packaging, that is a very fast way of saying, saying okay, we can run all these different systems as fast as we need to, and we can communicate almost as if they are one single system. Yeah, so it goes beyond multi-chip packages, and we're looking at multi-package systems 
that are using light to transfer transfer all of that data very quickly. And I think the thermal management of that is a key, especially in the data centers, not just for removing the, the potential heat damage that can happen, but also reducing the amount of energy those places are consuming. And that is, of course, a big issue for the industry. The challenge there is that just like anything else, heat can cause all sorts of problems in the term of signal integrity. So you think about uh, uh, heat inside a, a chip, which has been one of the biggest problems. It's always been the big problem for 3D ICs. Heat can also cause drift in the signal, so it misses the filters. And so you basically don't get those signals efficiently or even at all. You Now you have to start thinking about, okay, how do we adjust this and how do we catch those signals? How do we modify this? What's the temperature at? around the uh, where the signal is going. So it's a whole different problem that needs to be solved. It's a great engineering problem. Are, are we seeing the design for these AI chips and for the problems that they that are associated with AI chips? Are we seeing a lot of differentiation in how these companies are approaching these problems? Or is everyone trying to consolidate into one solution? These are pretty much one-off types of designs and they're probably going to run hundreds of millions of dollars by the time they're done. The advantage will be that uh, certainly you can save on real estate, you can save on energy, you can uh, get results faster, and probably you can do multiple derivative types of chips off of these as they go forward. But this is pretty much one vendor types of things. Where this goes next, which gets interesting, and this is where a lot of the buzz is right now, is into the chiplet world where you start getting commercial chiplets for sale, almost a, basically a supermarket of chiplets where you say, go in and say, okay, here's the specs I want, here's what we need. We don't necessarily need to run this block at the fastest speed, what's available, and maybe we we want the most advanced logic, maybe we do, and maybe we do 80% of the chip ahead of time and say, okay, what do we need to customize this? So really what the search is on for right now, and this is what EDA has always focused on, is commonalities. Where are the commonalities? What is good enough? And this is also being driven to a large extent by some of the foundries because they're looking at this saying, hey, if we can make these things faster, we can make a lot more money. One of the interesting areas in the, in the conversations I'm having with people in the industry, there's a lot of discussion uh, about moving EDA or having the EDA engineers more involved in the packaging and on the back end where they have not traditionally been because the packages are becoming so complex and they're really driving a lot of the um, uh, innovation in the industry right now. Um, did you notice that much at DAC? There is a lot of talk and has been for a long time about combining uh, things like uh, design for manufacturing, design for tests, design for yield, all of that is, is still critical. The big problem there, and it's been a persistent problem since going all the way back into the early 2000s, is who owns the data? How do you share that data between the fab, between the uh, IP vendors, between the EDA vendors? Yeah, theoretically, it's all owned by the company that is making the chip, but the reality is particularly with AI, you're combining things. Now, when you combine these things, you may have a different product than when you started out. The whole idea behind AI is that it will get better at certain things as time goes on. It will itself adjust. Once it adjusts, you've got a whole new IP there. Who owns that? That's a really interesting point as well. The whole is greater or different than the aggregate. And that creates all kinds of questions about who owns that IP. And IP has always been the challenge for the chiplet world to begin with, right? Is, is how do we get these chips communicating between each other from different companies in a way that protects the IP, but also functions well the way you described in this marketplace. That has been the challenge. And, and there have been some discussions about developing clearing houses for that. There's a, a couple of companies who come in and offer to try and develop a system for managing IP amongst companies and being a clearinghouse for that. But I don't think anyone has really solved that particular problem in a way that makes companies comfortable yet. No, it's an AI digital gestalt, and we've never dealt with that in the industry. From this conference, looking forward, what would you say is going to be the concentration for designers over the next year, between now and next year's DAC? I think it's all about reliability as we go forward. And that reliability used to be just, we're going to make a chip, we know it's going to work, we've got everything all lined up, and we've got this tested, and we know it's going to happen. Doing that with an AI chip is a lot different. 
so now we have things that will change. We have lots of capabilities in here in terms of the hardware, but how do you track how an AI model morphs over time? How does it, how do you measure reliability there? So you're seeing a lot more interest in things like digital twins and nobody's quite sure how those are going to be monetized or used, but everybody r realizes that you need to be able to track this thing live in real time as it's actually in use in the field. For one thing, it's going to give you some information about how this thing is, is aging, how it's behaving under whatever stress conditions it happens to be. And one of the things about AI is the utilization of circuitry is significantly higher than it would be for a lot of other applications. You've got more data, you've got more processing elements, and you've got many more elements just in general that need to communicate with each other. On top of that, you need to be able to look at this system and say, okay, how is it operating? What do we actually know about how this thing is, is operating under the hood? What's causing the hallucinations? Are we seeing silent data corruption because we're leveraging this uh, hardware and, and system at a much higher rate than it's ever been used before? This is the same problem you're starting to see in automotive where you're start, starting to see these autonomous uh, robo-taxis. Those are in use almost all the time. Vehicles typically run a few hours a day at most. These things are running around the clock. You need to be able to monitor these all the time. Same thing's going on inside data centers. You need to be able to monitor what's going on because any downtime is going to cost you a lot of money. You know, that's a really interesting point that comes up. We've discussed, of course, for years, this idea of shift left, right? You take uh, take what you, uh, any given point in the development cycle and shift that left so that you can improve the development cycle. But now I've heard more terms of shift right first and then bring that back onto the development cycle because there is this increasing need for reliability, for safety, for you know all of these complex reasons to know what's happening in the field with these chips so that we can improve them on the front end as the real world has an impact on them. And that's everything from how they handle and distribute heat to the kinds of uh, environments that they're being used in, whether they're hot or cold. So there's a lot of information there that I think could be useful for improving the reliability if we can get it. Yeah, there's even a question whether shift left and shift right are, are applicable terms anymore. We may be down to concurrent computing and con concurrent design because really what we're looking at is all this stuff needs to be considered at every step all the way through the flow and all at once. That is an excellent point. And the, the old silos of people working within their particular space on a chip, the systems are so reliant upon you know, every piece of the step all the way through, any one of those could could throw off the whole chip. So everything has to be considered. And one thing you are seeing, though, with all this change that's going on is the whole industry is buzzing. Now, we certainly saw this at ECTC. We're starting to see this at DAC. This is a just a sign of just how complex the problem is that needs to be solved and also how we are starting to blur the lines between front end, back end, whatever it happens to be. It's all happening together and every segment of the industry is benefiting and also participating in it. One of the other topics that I think you're starting to see inside a lot of these shows and conferences is, okay, AI is going to be great, but it's also going to displace things. It's a fundamental change in how things are done all the way through society, through entire ecosystems and the entire economy. So who's going to lose their job? And I think I asked probably about 150 people. So whose job is it going to take? And there were a lot of comments about it'll probably impact some of the new engineers coming into the industry. It'll certainly impact some of the uh, software programmers. But without fail, almost nobody thought it was going to take their job. I'm not sure if that's optimistic thinking and unrealistic or whether it's true because we do have a talent shortage all the way through this industry that's never been resolved and the young people are just not coming into this industry at the same rate they're going into other ones anything that can be automated is going to be automated with ai and that's going to affect certain jobs in certain ways at the same time it's also going to create a lot of opportunity in ways that i don't think we're even beginning to understand yet what else about DAC? What did you uh, see? You mentioned seeing every booth had something about AI going on in it. Um, 
what else did you notice there? Was it a bigger show this year than it has been in the past? I know it used to be a huge show and then it kind of shrunk down. Did you see more interest in, in design this year than there has been? I'm not sure how much bigger it was, but it certainly was a bit more vibrant in terms of the new ideas because of AI and some of the changes that are going on. I think AI is, as I said, AI is driving the move to 3D ICs. It's driving the move to digital twins. And it's also driving a lot of talk about what is AI actually going to be able to do and how will it do it and what will be the consequences of doing that. And that has everybody talking, and there are, at this point, no real answers other than the fact that, yeah, yeah AI is very good at certain things, but it is still a black box type of technology. That's a really interesting point, the black box technology. I'm curious, right now we're seeing a lot of general AI development happening in the design, and I'm curious how long it will take before we start seeing very application-specific AI. It does one thing really well, but we're not asking it to do everything. And depending on what kind of application that goes into, that could improve some of the design elements of it instead of trying to get it to be a one-size-fits-all. That is one of the ways of controlling it and making sure that your results are consistent and good. Really, what you're trying to do is tighten up the control loops all the way through this. And that's basically what's been happening for a lot of the EDA tools because they can't afford for these chips to misbehave in bad ways, particularly when they're used in mission critical and safety critical types of applications. What else it can do has not been totally determined yet. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think we're just at the very beginning of what AI will become. And we have absolutely no idea at this point just how far it will go and how well it will do what, the, what it's supposed to do. Will there be consistent problems that say, okay, we can't rely on it for this? We don't know yet. Thanks, Ed. And that's all for this episode of Inside Chips. For more in-depth coverage and exclusive insight into the semiconductor industry, visit semiengineering.com. I'm Gregory Haley, and we'll see you on the next spin.